In most healthcare settings worldwide, there are strict frameworks in place regulating the use of chemotherapy drugs like vincristine. These include prohibitions against storing such drugs in a fridge with other medicines and giving them in conjunction with other therapies. In many countries, there are also regulations specifying that a registered chemotherapy nurse must be present during the procedure and that the treatment must be given in a special room or bay. These types of frameworks and regulations are known as standard operating procedures or guidelines. These standard operating procedures and guidelines apply widely and are not specific to the use of drugs like vincristine. For example, well known are the Advanced Trauma Life Support Guidelines from the American College of Surgeons and the World Health Organization's Pain Ladder for Safe and Effective Administration of Opiate Analgesia. In the film we have just seen, you should clearly note that the standard operating procedures and guidelines were not adhered to. Yes, it's about Mrs. Jane Hughes. I've seen this prescription for uh, metoprexate you sent down. You've already got her down for her IV this morning and I've only sent her vincristine up. The methotrexate should not have been dispensed on the same day as vincristine. A mix-up of these two drugs could lead to fatal consequences and a protocol was in place to prevent this. Had it been adhered to, the error may have been avoided. OK then, look, I'll uh, prepare it for this afternoon. Factors that may have led to the pharmacist breaking the protocol are many and varied. They include the pressure of work and a hierarchical management structure which does not encourage constructive questioning of the doctor in charge. I've come to pick up the chemotherapy for Mrs Jane Hughes, intrathecal methotrexate. Dr Campbell should not have been allowed to administer chemotherapy. I don't seem to have you down. He was not confirmed as having the skills to do this. Despite this, the nurse was persuaded to allow him to practice on the ward and the pharmacist allowed him to pick up the prescription. A system was in place, but not adhered to. Here we are, Doctor. Methotrexate, two milligrams in two minutes. Sadly, in many areas of healthcare, when these procedures are in place, their purpose is often misunderstood and they may even be treated with contempt. Lack of organisational leadership, poor communication, high workloads and inadequate education and training all contribute to the lack of adherence. Actually, standard operating procedures and guidelines can be a great protection against error. Their objective is to make patients and practitioners as safe as possible each and every time that a procedure or action is undertaken. Standard operating procedures do not destroy clinical autonomy or decision making. Rather, they provide an evidence-based, agreed framework for protecting patients against error. Wherever possible, they standardise the procedures in place so that everyone understands their role and what is expected of them. Where standard operating procedures and guidelines are present, they must be adhered to. Where they are not in place, appropriate measures should be taken to establish them. We need to make sure we have an organisation-wide view of standard operating procedures and guidelines so these essential components of safe care do not fall by the wayside. We need to see such procedures as the hallmark of professionalism and good patient care rather than as an enemy. When standard operating procedures and guidelines are present, we need strong and visible leadership to ensure they are adhered to. For your organisation, ask yourself the following questions. Could standard operating procedures and guidelines be put in place to make delivery of care safer? Are standard operating procedures and guidelines being adhered to? And if not, which pressures prevent their operation? Is there a culture of contempt within your organisation for standard operating procedures and guidelines? We can only really be sure that we're delivering safe care for patients if all the healthcare workers involved have received the right training and are up to date. A healthcare professional who has not received appropriate training or guidance may feel under low pressure to just do the job. There can be a lot of pressure to cope with the workload by operating outside their competence, especially for junior staff. Such staff may not be well placed to judge their own level of competence. They may be over or underconfident because of their limited experience. This is a potentially dangerous situation where errors can easily occur. In the film, it was obvious that nobody had a clear understanding of the level of training or experience that the newly appointed Dr. Campbell had. Oh, Dr. Livingston, before you go, 
I uh, just wanted to be clear about the amount of clinical work Dr. Campbell will actually be doing. How much have we got? He'll take on virtually anything I would. If he's unsure about anything, then I'm always here to help. So he's familiar with the IT rules? Well, I would certainly expect so. He's very senior, Anne. He can do just about anything I can. But Fiona, he's not on the IT register yet, is he? No, but I'm seeing Dr. Munro about that later and we'll sort it out then. Sister Lynch, in fact, queried this several times with his colleague, Dr. Livingstone. Despite this lack of clarity, Dr. Campbell was left in charge once Dr. Livingstone left the ward. Sister Roberts, I'm Dr. Campbell, covering for Dr. Livingstone today. A culture where healthcare workers help each other, especially when staff are stretched, may inadvertently increase the risk to patients. Often, many staff may not easily recognize the boundaries of their own expertise and experience. Poorly trained healthcare workers can be a major contributing factor, leading to adverse events. Many countries are good at ensuring a certain standard as part of undergraduate training. However, in many cases, the last assessment a healthcare professional faces is at their university or college. Assessments are not just about ensuring a certain and sustainable level of skill, knowledge or competence. They're also a reflection of a wider culture of safe and effective practice. Education and training are critical components in the quest to improve patient safety. At the very least, all healthcare workers must understand the key concepts of patient safety. For those already in practice, programs must be developed to give them the skill to continue to practice safely. Most of all, healthcare professionals should know and understand safety procedures in their own local service contexts. In other high-risk industries, careful attention is paid to ensuring the ongoing competence of frontline staff. For example, a typical airline pilot would probably have something like 100 assessments of their competency over the course of their career. In some countries, doctors have none. For your organisation, ask yourself the following questions. How do you know that the colleagues you work with have received the training they need to do their job well? Do you have a way of assessing colleagues you work with to ensure they're competent? Do you have a framework in place to ensure induction with local procedures? Do you know what you should do if you have concerns about the competence of your colleagues and the safety of their practice? Would you be supported in raising your concerns? And finally, how would you know if your healthcare system allowed an unskilled or untrained healthcare professional to practice?